And that will do it for Thursday's trading session. Let's take a look at how the major indices ended the day. A bumper day. We saw that CPI print there lifting all boats. The Dow ending up the day 1,198 points. They're up almost 4% there. S&P 500 up more than 5.5% at 200 points. And the tech heavy Nasdaq up about 7 third of a percent there. 760 point gain. Today is Thursday, the 10th of November. This is a recap for the stock market activities today. Uh, folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Uh, what a day, what a day, what a day. Absolute lunacy. In reaction to the CPI, which did not go down by that much, by the way, and a lot of categories went higher. We'll talk about that in a second. But in reaction to the cooked numbers from the CPI, the market decided to rally significantly higher. And it was one of the biggest financial orgasms in history. It was felt here in planet Earth all the way to Uranus. And folks, in days like this, time is of the essence. So let's not waste any more time and dive right into it. And here it is, in focus tonight. WTF. When delusion takes over rationale, it's time to get out. Today in the morning, we got the CPI report, and the number was 7.7% year over year and 6.3% year over year, excluding the non important food and energy, of course. And hey, inflation is down uh, to 7.7%. It's over, right? Inflation is gone. Poof. It's not like back in the 70s, we haven't seen dips in inflation only for it to go higher again. No, we haven't seen that before. If we cover that part of the chart. But folks, as I say all the time, the devil is always, always in the details. We'll talk about that in a second. But the market shot up significantly higher in reaction to the CPI report. The Dow Industrial Average closed the day with gains of almost 12 Hundred points, and the Nasdaq scored gains of over seven percent in a single day. The dollar suffered the worst day since March 2009. The stock market is acting as if this is the bottom. Stocks across the board shot up significantly higher. Among them, Mama Kathy Wood, RKKKKKKK, which shot up higher, scoring gains of over fourteen percent. The best day ever. The most shorted stocks shot up higher by 11% in one of the most violent rallies ever. And the Nasdaq is now pricing in interest rate cuts by early next year. It's over, folks. The bottom is here. The bear market is over. We're done. And of course, we should have seen this coming from a million miles away since uh, Jim Cramer gave the kiss of death to the bears by announcing yesterday that growth stocks could see more horror after CPI data release. The inverse Cramer ETF spot on once again. So what is the fuss all about? Is inflation really over? It's gone, right? Uh, the good professor from Warren, Jeremy Siegel, came out today and said that inflation is done. It's over. It's officially done. Same guy, by the way, who missed the dot-com bubble, who said back in 2008 that we're going to have a good year in stocks, who missed 2018, missed the bottom in 2020, claimed that inflation is transitory until he changed his mind. A little too late, of course. So, of course, he got a great track record here when he says that inflation is over. It's gone. But look at this. What categories went down month over month? Number one, piped utility gas services down 4.6% month over month and used cars no surprise here everybody knows that used cars prices have been going down nothing to see here down 2.4% who cares airline fares down 1.1% fruits and vegetables down 0.9% apparel down 0.7% and dairy down 0.1% month over month on the other hand fuel oil up almost 20% month over month, gasoline up 4% month over month, vehicle insurance up 1.7%, food away from home, cereal, bakery, alcoholic beverages, rent, motor vehicle maintenance and repair, meats, non-alcoholic beverages, new vehicles, all items, even the core CPI. Everything went higher month over month. But hey, used cars prices are down, inflation is over. And folks, we know what this is all about. You got the money managers, 
They all took mortgages they cannot really afford. They all took car loans they cannot really afford. They all promised the mistress a Christmas gift they cannot really afford. And now it has been a bad year for them. The market is damn big. No bonuses, baby. But he got the fourth quarter. Why do you think that we always have a Santa rally? It's because the money managers use the client money and they pump the market higher to score the bonuses. They're sending your money in like they're sending sheep to the slaughter. And of course, when the market goes down later on, they say, whoops, we thought it's the bottom. It looked good back then. But who gives a shit about your money? They got their bonuses. That's all what it really is. And folks, look at this delusion by the bulls. A couple of weeks ago, it was, hey, the economy is so bad. We have a recession risk. Mr. Powell has to pivot. And Mr. Powell came out and said, how about you guys f off? There is no pivot. What are you talking about? Inflation is too hot. And before that, it was, oh, earnings are not that bad. The market can handle uh, all of these Fed rate hikes. No problem here. That did not work out once we got earnings and they were abysmal. So now they flipped to the old script of, uh, oh, it's a, the soft landing is back. Inflation is peaking, peak inflation, and the jobs market is holding. As if we've never heard this before. The same story, deja vu, summer 2022, June, you know the story. And the problem with the move we got today is, it was a massive gap higher, it was an algorithmic reaction, the robots went haywire the moment the CPI came out. They looked at one number. The estimate was core CPI 0.4%, month over month, it came out light at 0.3%. Immediately, the dollar got sold like you've never seen before, and the futures shot up to the moon. Okay, so I'm supposed to chase the move when Amazon opens up by 9%, and the premiums for calls are sky high? How about no thanks? We can't do that. We missed the opportunity. So who's doing the pumping here? It's the quant funds, the algorithmic funds, the robots. They did the heavy lifting here. And of course, when the mom and pops see the action, by the afternoon, they jump in. What do you know? What they're doing is basically fighting the Fed. Folks, we have two classic mistakes in investing and trading. Mistake number one is fighting the Fed. So these mom and pops get sucked in and then the Fed comes out days later and says, you know what, this move is not warranted. We're gonna do 75 in December. They have to come out and say that because they cannot afford to let financial conditions loosen again. But what do you know, the mom and pops get slaughtered. Same old, same old. This is mistake number one, fighting the Fed. Never fight the Fed. When the Fed says no pivot and it's too premature to talk about a pause, and oh, by the way, we need financial conditions to stay tight for as long as possible for us to see the reflection in the real economy. And the market says, la 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 la, I can't hear you. I'm going to do my thing. Uh, the CPI went a tick down. And that's it. It's over. Inflation is over. I don't care what the Fed is going to say. They're going to pivot. That's what the market is doing, fighting the Fed. And if you're not sure what the Fed said last time around, here's Jerome Powell himself explaining to you that there is not going to be a pivot. You guys are out of your minds. Take a look. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. We will stay the course until the job is done. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. On the need to slow the pace of rate increases at some point, is a, is a downshift contingent on a string of better inflation data specifically between now and, uh, let's say, the December meeting? Or is that something that the Fed could potentially proceed with independent of that data, given the lagged effects that you mentioned? So a couple of things on that. Um, we do need to see inflation coming down decisively, and good evidence of that would be uh, a series of down monthly readings. Of course, that's what we'd all love to see, uh, but thats I've never thought of that as the appropriate test for slowing the pace of increases or for identifying the appropriately restrictive level that we're aiming for. Uh, we need to bring our policy stance down to a level that's sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to our 2 percent objective over the medium term. How will we know that we've reached that level? Well, we'll take into account the full range of analysis and data that bear on that question, guided by our assessment of how much financial conditions have tightened, um, the effects that, that tightening is actually having on the real economy and on inflation, um, taking into consideration lags, as I mentioned. Um, we will be looking at, at real rates, for example, all across the yield curve and all, all other financial conditions and uh, as we make that assessment. Hi, uh, Howard Schneider with uh, with Reuters. <clears throat> Look, I, I'm sure there's going to be uh, tons of confusion out there about whether this means you're going to slow in December or not. Uh, would you say that the bias right now is not for another 75 basis point increase? So um, what I want to do uh, is is put that question of pace in the context of our of our our broader tightening program, if I may. 
and, and hit the talk about the statement language uh, along the way. So I, I think you can think about our, our tightening program as, as really addressing three questions. The first of which was and has been how fast to go. The second is uh, how high to raise our policy rate. And the third will be eventually how long to remain at, at, a, at a restrictive level. So the take here is, he says, we want to see inflation readings going down, not just one report, but multiple ones. That would be nice to see. But even if that happens, it's not going to be the reason why the Fed is going to pivot or slow down the rate of interest rate hikes. He's looking at financial conditions. And right now, every time the stock market rallies, financial conditions loosen. You see, if the reading is above zero, financial conditions are tight. But if the reading is below zero or trending down, it means financial conditions are loosening. And this is from the Chicago Fed. We now see financial conditions loosening again. And are financial conditions really tight enough when the CPI goes down a tick? and we see an insane rally in the stock market? Is that really an indicator that financial conditions are tight? Of course not. If anything, it provides proof to the Fed that financial conditions need to be tightened even more. On top of that, when we talk about inflation expectations and the sentiment in the market and the economy, when folks are talking about another round of stimmies to fight inflation, when people are swiping their credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, with no care at all, when they think that their jobs are in the bag, and oh, on top of that, hey, the government will issue a new round of stimmies, is this sentiment an indicator of tighter financial conditions or loose financial conditions? And of course, fighting the Fed is a major mistake because the higher the stock market goes, the more insane this rebound is, the Fed will have to come out being even more hawkish. And today, they gave it a shot. Immediately, when they saw the market reaction, they came out with the warnings. Take a look. The Kansas City Fed president looked at the uh, inflation numbers this morning and said, monetary policy clearly has more work to do. She said, inflationary pressures have yet to let up. Monetary policy and financial conditions must continue to tighten, according to Esther George. Joining others, by the way, who have made similar comments in the wake of that better-than-expected inflation report, she goes on to say higher inflation expectations point to a need for considerably higher rates uh, and that the impetus for inflation has changed from being initially about uh, uh, moved by goods prices. Now it's moved by tight labor markets. She is seeing a little bit of help there, Brian. Some early indications, she says, the labor markets might be cooling. And the one somewhat dovish thing she says, but this goes back a ways. She says that a more measured approach to rate increases may be particularly useful. She had been opposed to those 75s, but clearly Esther George, who has long been hawkish, uh, continues to be so and sees a need for higher rates, as have several other Fed speakers today, Brian. But that has had little uh, impact, it would appear, on the market. And of course, the market decided to ignore all of that. Esther George, Neil Kashkari, Mr. Even Daly came out today warning that, hey, this is just one report. Don't make a big deal out of it. But the market, again, is fighting the Fed. So if you want to jump on the wagon and chase the rally, watch out for the Fed coming out and killing the rally again. Mistake number two, fighting the herd. Mistake number one, fighting the Fed. Mistake number two is fighting the herd. You fight the Fed by following the herd, and you fight the herd by betting against them. So if you're going to say, okay, you know what? These morons know nothing at all. The robots went haywire. And I'm going to double down on puts right now. That could be a painful journey because you have no idea when this move is going to stop. So what are you saying here, Maverick? Are you saying uh, don't fight the Fed, meaning don't chase the ratty, but don't fight the herd, don't bet against them. So what do we do? How about when delusion takes over rationale, it's time to step back. How about you step back? The indicators say... If you look at the dollar, if you look at yields, if you look at the VIX, the indicators say this mania could continue for a few more days, if not weeks, until something put a stop to it. And my hunch is the higher it goes, the higher the likelihood that the Fed will come out and issue a statement. Or one of these Fed zombies will come out and say something really, really hawkish to kill the ratty. But in the meantime, do you really want to hold the bag betting against this insanity? Not really. Not me. So what does that mean? Maverick, I'm holding the bag and puts already. Do I average down? Do I uh, roll to another expiration date? What do I do here? I leave that decision to you. But again, if you're going to average down in a losing trade, you're fighting the herd. If you're going to extend the expiration date, you're betting that you know when the reversal is going to happen, but you don't. So the easiest way is buck up and take the loss. Of course, you could wake up in the morning tomorrow and we see the futures down 500, 600 because something happened. But the indicators, Dixie, Gold, VIX, 10-year yield, all of them indicate that this has more room to go. I don't want to fight it. I'd rather take the loss right now 
and step aside and watch the shit show. Grab a big bag of popcorn and watch the massacre as the herd continues to pile in. In the meantime, if you got FOMO, if you don't want to miss out on the rally or perhaps maybe a pullback coming in some of these insane rallies that we got, here's what you do. You know what happens when the dollar goes down. Commodities move higher, but specifically metals, oil, chips, these names shoot up higher. When yields go down, what goes higher? Home builders, real estate, utilities, and technology. So you can buy calls in these names and chase the move higher. Have at it if you want to do that. But keep in mind that call options are getting really, really expensive. On the other hand, if you want to bet to the downside on something, how about you bet to the downside on two things. Number one, Tesla, the souffle. You know why? Because it doesn't matter if we have a dead cat bounce in the souffle. It's an opportunity to short because the name is going to go down big again. Because the genius Elon Musk, he now warns Twitter employees that they might file for bankruptcy next year. Twitter will file for bankruptcy next year. Wait a minute here. This guy just spent, what, $54 billion to buy this company and now it's bankrupt already? What's going on here? I'll tell you what's going on. The company has no cash. That is the surprise that Elon Musk is finding right now. And the advertisers are gone. There is no revenue to finance this operation. So he has to finance it out of his pocket, meaning he has to dump shares of Tesla. Every time Tesla pops higher, Elon is going to take that as an opportunity to dump in your little heads. So when I keep my Tesla puts, I have Elon Elon in my side, and that's a big whale. But what ally do I have in my, say, Microsoft puts? I don't have anything. That thing could go higher, so I have to get out. The other thing that I'm keeping the puts on, and maybe doubling down, is anything related to tulips. Coinbase, micro tragedy, you know the deal. These things are going to blow up. Any pop is an opportunity to short. Why do we say that? Because FTX is going to blow up. Nobody's going to save FTX here. This story is way bigger than anybody anticipated. It turns out that Sam Bankrupt Fried has been playing with the client's cash. He tapped into customer's cash and used that cash for risky bets. He went to the casino. He used that cash to fund his failed Alameda research. This guy is going to jail and nobody's going to bail him out. Of course, he came out today and said he's sorry, he uh, up. And dude, dude, what are you doing here? Some lawyer, for the love of God, should reach out to this guy and say, keep your mouth shut. What are you doing here? You're admitting guilt? To millions of people? Do you have any idea how big that tsunami of lawsuits that is coming your way? Keep your mouth shut. And of course, Sam goes out and begs for four billion dollars to bail out his company. When he says four, he means seven. And guess what? Nobody's gonna bail him out here. Nobody. Because this is a criminal case. You're not gonna bail out a criminal. So what we have to do right now is hold hands and brace for impact. Because this thing is gonna blow up within days and cryptos will go bust. Companies like Coinbase, Micro Tragedy will go bust. So I'm keeping these two shorts, Tesla and uh, Tulips for now. Other shorts, I'm out for now. Except, of course, the ones with the longer expiration dates. We're talking in 2023, deep into 2023, and they're closer to the money. Those I can hold because the losses are not that big. But anything out of the money with shorter expiration date, my advice is you might be hoping that something is going to happen tomorrow and we might get a massive down day and we're back on track, baby. But what if that doesn't happen? And all indicators for now saying it's not going to happen. So if you have puts with shorter expiration date and you're out of the money, take the loss. Take the loss, step aside, watch the show, and wait for the reversal to happen. This is what I'm going to do right now. Because these delusional maniacs really believe that this is the bottom. This is it. It's over. Something is going to hit them. And this thing could be, oh, inflation is actually going higher, meaning the Fed will come out even more hawkish and caution the market not to take it too far. Or it could be something relating to the financial risk or the upcoming recession, such as something blowing up. And of course, if that happens, the bulls are going to switch to, oh, Mr. Proud has to pivot now because we have financial risk and the economy is about to head into a recession. And two minutes ago, you said, oh, we're going to have a soft landing and inflation is peaking. It's delusion. It's stupidity. It doesn't make sense. But again, two classic mistakes happening at the same time. Fighting the Fed and fighting the herd. I'd rather step back and watch the show. Watch who's going to win in this battle. Is it going to be these delusional maniacs, assuming this is the bottom and going all in? Or is it going to be the Fed because they're fighting each other? The market is making it harder for the Fed to fight inflation. And the Fed will have to come out even more aggressive. So they go tit for tat. And it's going to be a painful ride here. The volatility is good, but can you really call the direction day to day? That's that's the challenge here. And folks, we're going to talk about this a little more in the charts analysis. But before we do that, how about we see how the indices close today? And uh, here we go.
the Dow Industrial Average closing in the green by 1,201.43 points or a gain of 3.70%. The Nasdaq up by 760.97 points or a gain of 7.35%. The S&P also in the green by 207.80 points or a gain of 5.54%. All sectors in the green led by technology consumer cyclicals, and real estate. Meanwhile, the laggards were energy, defensives, and healthcare. So this was risk on. Technology, cyclicals, real estate, metals, leading the pack. This is risk on kind of day. The market says this is the bottom, and higher we go from this point on. It's delusional, but in the meantime, the advance to decline ratios, NYSE 93% advancing versus 6% declining. The NASDAQ 85% advancing versus 14% declining. When it comes to commodities, the dollar is down big, almost 2.5%, and immediately we see a massive rally in commodities, but mostly in metals. Metals are the most sensitive to the dollar, and we see the majority of the gains in metals. Gold up, silver up, platinum up, copper up, palladium up, everything is up. And of course, energy was up, but it wasn't up as much as we anticipated because some folks say, hey, profits being taken out from energy and moving to technology, buying the dip in chips, the RKKs of the world, because the bottom is here, right? And I say if you want to play the dollar going down, give it a couple of days, let them take their profits from uh, energy, and then the aggregate demand will kick in, and we will see energy bouncing higher again. There is no way energy will go down with the dollar going down too. But of course, the risk to all of this is uh, Chinese lockdowns. So if we have the dollar going down, igniting a rally for equities, and then China adding a downward pressure on commodities, this would be the so-called Goldilocks scenario for the bulls. But notice that natural gas, aka the party boy, was up by almost 5% today. And remember, which category led the declines in the CPI today month over month? Natural gas. Well, look at what natural gas is doing right now in the month of November. What do you think the next CPI reading would be? Watch how the CPI goes hotter in December for the reading of November, of course. And then all of these clowns come out and say, Oh, ba 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 Right? What would the good professor say if that happens? Because he declared that inflation is gone. It's over. When it comes to softs, cocoa up, lumber up by over 3%. Look at that. Coffee scoring gains of 2 and a quarter percent. Now that I'm out of the trade, coffee goes up. No surprise here. OJ was the decliner of the day, down about 3.5%. And then we see more modest gains for meats, about 1% apiece for both live and feeder cattle futures. On the other hand, lean hogs with a mini pullback today. When it comes to grains, down across the board for the most part, lots of pain in soybeans, both down more than 2% for the day. We're talking about soybeans and soybean meal. But oils remain hot. Soybean oil was in the green. Corn, down about 1 and 3 quarters of a percent. And then more muted reactions for wheat and rough rice. And then another down day for oats and canola futures, about 1% apiece to the downside. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what's going on here? Another piece of evidence that this mania could continue. The volume shot up significantly higher, and we see a stampede in buying calls. Tesla, number one, the hottest table by far. At around 3 million contracts traded today, about 53% of those were calls. At a number two, Amazon, with around 2.6 million contracts traded today, about 69% of those were calls. Apple at number three, with around 2 million contracts traded today, about 55% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We begin with the ticker UPS for, you guessed it, UPS. Somebody sees the rally in UPS extending and they bought the 180 calls for the expiration date, December 2nd, with expectations that UPS could score gains of more than 5% by then. They paid around one buck and 45 cents a piece, Tanner, this trade all in all, spending around two million dollars. And then what about the ticker AR, K -K 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 for Tesla Witch, Kathy Wood. Big day today, but somebody's fading the rip. They bought the 33 puts for the expiration date, January 20, with expectations that the name could move down and lose more than 9.5% of its value by then. They paid around 2 bucks a piece, Tanner, this trade, 
All in all, spending around $2 million. And then, what about the ticker Alibaba? Oh, excuse me, B-A-B-A -A for Alibaba. There you go. Somebody sees more upside coming here, and they bought the 80 bucks calls with the expiration date, December 2nd, with expectations that Alibaba could add gains of more than 15.5% by then. They paid around one buck and 60 cents apiece. Stanner, this trade, all in all, spending around $1.6 million. Notice that the retail crowd is participating in this. They're the one buying Alibaba. They're the one betting against the RKK and they're the one buying call options on leveraged indices. As we can see from the ticker T triple Qs, this is the three times leverage index for the Qs. So if the Qs go up by 1% in a single day, the T triple Qs goes up by 3% and then it resets the next day. So this is retail crowd kind of plays and somebody bought the 23 calls for the expiration date December 9 with expectations that the name could score gains of more than 11% by then. They paid around one buck and 45 cents a piece, Tanner, the trade, all in all spending around one and a half million dollars. And here's the other side of this trade, the ticker SPXS. Now this is the inverse ETF for the SPX, for the SPY, excuse me. Meaning if the SPY goes down 1%, I believe this one goes down by 3%, and then it resets. So this is a bad fading the rep that we got today and they bought the 23 calls for the expiration date december 16 with expectations that the name could score gains of more than eight percent by then they paid around one buck and 15 cents a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars on to the heat map what's going on here nothing to see a sea of green an algorithmic reaction to what happened in the morning the dollar goes down everything blows up higher the robots bought everything here but you can see that this is a risk on not a uh, value type of trade and you can spot this right away by the underperformance from healthcare and energy Yet the majority of the gains in the risk on the big caps the software the rkk's of the world these are the names that bounce the most so for now nothing to see here and the question becomes how long will the algorithmic bounce last? Because we're not going to see this repeatedly every single day, even if the bounce lasts for let's say two weeks or so. At some point we're going to start to see losers, and these losers will lag behind. Now if the market believes that this is the bottom, they're going to buy the most overbeaten names, which happens to be in technology and the RKKs of the world, and they're going to take profits from the value names, the winners year to date, energy, defensives, healthcare, etc. But if it is, hey, let's be rational here, maybe the seasonality is good, but it doesn't mean risk on with blindfolds on, and in a few days we will see value at performing again, so watch out for that. And here's the heat map for the ETFs, again nothing to see here, green across the board, value up, growth up, of course growth at performing value, but everything is in the green, with exception of the EWZ for Brazil in uh, internationals, but besides that, you could have placed your bets anywhere in the roulette table, placed your chips anywhere, and you won big. On to the charts, and we begin with SPY. S&P 500 30 minutes chart what's going on here you can see from the reaction right away that the market is reversing something and this something is the reversal of the reversal so we know right after Powell the market went down that was the reversal but the market is so stubborn it wants to rally it wants to fight the Fed and this is why it refused to go down it should have gone down big it should have been at 362 right now but it didn't because the mentality is the seasonality is good and now the bulls have the piece of evidence they've been waiting for to say, okay, Mr. Powell, the pivot is going to happen whether you like it or not. And therefore, we see a massive gap up and a reversal. Of course, it went down to retest 385.15 and then it blasted higher. They closed at the highs of the day. This behavior is bullish, not bearish. It indicates that the mom and pops joined the rally at the end of the day, but also the shorts joined at the end and started covering their positions. And for now, this is not an indicator that the chart is going to pull back tomorrow or the day after. If anything, it is likely to extend for a little while. It might go to 398 right away and then pull back. And in my opinion, this is not going to stop by a technical reason, such as resistance or overbought. This will stop when somebody from the Fed comes out and says, hey, party's over. You're way over your head. We're not going to pivot. Yes, we know the CPI is down a little bit, but that's nothing. And you know what? We were going to do the 50 basis points in December. But now that the market rallied significantly higher in a short amount of time, now we're going to do 75 instead. Boom. 
the rally goes kaput. And here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the SPY, the S&P 500. For now, it appears that the cup and handle that we talked about last night is playing out. We have a confirmation now. The volume went higher on an upside day. The RSI is back in positive divergence. And now the MACD is also back bouncing in positive divergence. We can see the green impressions on the histogram. No crossing to the negative territory yet. So for now, the bulls are back in charge. The save from the CPI, the robots, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. On the other hand, the chart is now stuck at a stiff resistance at around 3,960. It's a little above that right now, but this is going to be hard to pass. And of course, the most bullish scenario is the chart goes down in a retracement to 3,855, it catches support from that point on, and then it moves higher above 3,960. That would be the bullish scenario. Because if this continues to go higher impulsively, the Fed will come out and put a stop to it. Now, the bears should be looking at any sign of a reversal. That could be from a candlestick pattern, a rejection, a loss of support, but ultimately, the confirmation that this is over and it was a trap is if the chart loses 3,720 and a half. Now, here's the SPX, the weekly chart for the cash index for the S&P 500. Look at this. It's above 3,900. The MACD indicator shifted to positive. And if it does close like this by the end of the week, meaning tomorrow, this will be a confirmation that the bulls are back in charge and they will likely shoot up higher all the way to the next Fibonacci resistance. And that would be a Santa Ratty being front-loaded. See what happens. Here's the cues. What's going on here in the 30 minutes chart? Similar story. This is a reversal of the reversal because the market says we got the piece of evidence that we need for a pivot. So pivot optimism is back on the table again until the Fed puts an end to it. So for now, the chart is above 280, and the next resistance would be at around 284.26. Now, the chart is overbought, but again, this is lunacy. This is uh, the robots and the algos and the stampede, so they're not going to respect the indicators, at least for now. What's going to pull this down, once again, is a fundamental reason. The Fed coming out, a piece of data negating the peak inflation bullshit. We'll see what happens. But for now, the daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ, had it closed the week below the June bottom, we would have said, here comes the flush down. But here comes the rescue instead. And now we see the volume above average on a buying day. Billions, billions of dollars being pumped into the stock market by money managers for what? To score those bonuses, baby. They don't care. They don't care what's going to happen to the money in the long run. What they care about is closing the fourth quarter on a positive note. So for now, the June bottom is intact, and the chart is facing resistance at around 11,689. Now, the bears must not fight this until we see the June bottom being lost once again. Otherwise, we don't have any reversal signal here. The IWM 30 minutes chart for the Russell 2000, we got the gap higher. The chart went down in a retest of the support of 174.22. Here comes the gap, reversing the reversal, and now it's above 183.25. And is this an ABC pattern? If it is, the IWM goes all the way to the next level at around 188. And here's the chart responsible for the rally today. The dollar was down big. Look at this candle. It lost support big time. The negative divergence is back in the RSI. And the negative momentum in the MACD indicator is intensifying, indicating that the dollar should continue to go down, absent of the Fed coming out and ending the party. Now, the catch here is if we switch to a line chart and we use the Fibonacci levels, the chart is at support right now. Can it bounce? The problem is, even if it does bounce, the market will continue to rally higher until it becomes clear that the dollar is about to make higher highs. This is not going to happen without the Fed coming out and throwing cold water in this rally. And here it is, gold, the daily chart, popping higher, and now eyeing 1,763 as uh, the next resistance. Not overbought yet in the RSI. Plenty of room left in the MACD indicator if gold wants to move higher. And now gold, a reliable indicator, is saying the dollar is going to go down. This is a confirmation. And this chart is giving the stock market the green light to rally because it is the most reliable indicator for the dollar. Now, what about the daily chart for oil? Brent, what's going on here? Did not participate in the rally today, but still holding on onto the trend line of support. And if it does bounce so far, so good for the bulls. We're talking about oil bulls. But if this line is lost, it goes down all the way to 85. If it does, you look at the dollar. If the dollar is still going down, this is an opportunity to buy. But if the dollar reverses and goes higher, that would not be an opportunity to buy. What about the 10-year yield? What's going on here in the daily chart? The bear flag is playing out. And it got us all the way down to the lower range of the consolidation zone before. Now the negative divergence on the RSI is still here. 
the negative momentum on the MACD indicator is still here. So for now, everything is pointing out for lower yields in the 10, which means why do you want to fight it right now? Why do you want to bet against this rally when you have the dollar is going down and you got yields going down? absent of the fed intervening and saying hey this is going to loosen financial conditions stop it i don't want to fight the rally right now and the difference between this rally and other fake rallies before in the past yields did not go down or the dollar did not go down so there was no confirmation for the rally and it was so easy to spot that this is a fake rally not this time around because yields are going down the dollar is going down gold shooting up higher and oh by the way the vix is going down which we're going to talk about in a second but Here's the TLT, a daily chart, and as you can see, the reverse ABC pattern now out of the picture. But the chart is in for a battle because it's about to face the resistance zone. That's going to be tough to beat. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. What's going on here? Look at this. The VIX lost support at 24.29. If this continues, down it goes all the way to 20. And then I'll be buying puts with both hands. But folks, there is a possibility that the action that we got today is a fake out. And it's a massive trap, a one day trap, epic one. But this possibility sits at around, let's say, 35%. Now, if the dollar was up, if yields were going up, I would have said with confidence that this is a trap. But without these two participating, I can no longer say that this is a trap for sure. And now we have the VIX also down. Either this is one of the most epic traps in history, or this is going to go on until the Fed put a stop to it. Look at Apple, 30 minutes chart. Look at what's going on here. A massive reversal erasing all of these losses from previous days. And now the market is saying, hey, the pivot is back in the table. Meaning they want to go fight the 150 battle once again. They lost once. They lost twice. Can they lose again the third time? And would that seal the deal? But the mentality for now is the pivot is back on. And what does that mean? In plain English, it means we got all of these charts wanting to retrace the same levels from last week before Jerome Powell came out and ended the pivot dream. And I know what your question is. The question is, Maverick, so are you saying that I should ride the rally? Should I go with this all the way to 150 and see what happens? That's up to you. If you want to do that, that's entirely up to you. But be careful because premiums are really high right now and you're better off buying uh, call spreads instead to minimize the risk because at any moment any fed zombie can come out and say okay this is over you gotta stop now and it ends but the other question is do i fight it maverick do i buy puts at 150 for example when the chart becomes really really overbought if you're gonna do that you buy puts with shorter expiration dates and don't bet any money you cannot afford to lose now if you're confident and you have conviction that this chart is going down again and you want to bet against it right now, you don't want to wait for the reversal to happen. Buy in increments and buy for longer expiration dates. You buy now a little bit, then you buy a little more if it goes to 150 and it becomes really overbought. And then if it comes down and pierces below 145, you got a confirmation. This is pretty much over and you buy another batch. But going all in is too risky right now. Tesla, the souffle, 30 minutes chart. What's going on here? We got a bounce from the trend line, as you can see from yellow, and now the chart is forming a bull flag pattern. The likelihood is it's gonna go higher, but it's gonna stop at around 206.86 because this is a stiff resistance to pass above in a single shot. Now, I told you that I have uh, puts on Tesla. They're already in the money and for a longer expiration date. So I'm not worried here. Tesla can go higher. I don't care. I'm gonna average down because I have Elon Musk on my side here. Me and Reverend Elon tag teaming the souffle here. Keep buying. We're gonna dump a new little head. Here it is, the daily chart for Tesla, a line chart as you can see the channel, and we get a beautiful bounce from the lower edge of the channel. Oversold bounce, it's not gonna last, I promise you. And last but not least, how about tulips? Four hours chart, what's going on here? We got the oversold bounce, but again, the likelihood is this is not going to last. Sooner or later, we'll be down to 15,000, if not even below. And therefore, I say I'm not so confident betting against technology right now, but I am confident on betting against tulips because FTX is going to blow up, we will see another wave coming. And with that, folks, let's move on to the conclusion of this video. What do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have an early reading from the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. And this will be important because we have inflation expectations. So if this reading goes higher, the market might become jittery because it says, hey, watch out. Maybe the CPI went down a little tick month over month. It's still positive, but it went down a tick from the last reading. But inflation expectations are going higher, meaning there is no pivot here. So that could be a party pooper. And of course, happy Veterans Day to those who serve. 
For those who did not serve, also happy Veterans Day. Celebrate your family, whoever who served. You know the deal. And with that, folks, this is all I got for you for now. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again over the weekend. Take care. Admiral, we've got enemy ships in Sector 47. It's a trap! It's a trap! Also, who's Cat?